All right. Now, in Acts chapter 5, this is a long chapter. Um, not going to be able to probably get to everything, but there's one main theme that's going on here. Acts 15, it's, it, almost the entire chapter is dedicated to telling this one story. And it starts off in verse number 1 where it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So their premise is just saying, Look, you, if you're not circumcised, you cannot be saved. You do not have salvation unless you're circumcised. That's what these people are saying. So the whole rest of this chapter is kind of telling a story how like, you know, Barnabas and Paul are saying, no, that's not the case. You know, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. They're adamant about it. But they, you know, the, the people that are at the church there in Antioch are saying, well, let's send them down to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the disciples and these other great men of God and just see what they have to say about it. So that's kind of what happens in the story, just, just as a broad overview. They send them down there. They all talk about it and kind of debate it. And then they send them back with word again saying, yeah, no, it's not circumcision that saves you. But I want to spend a lot of time going into this because this is so true today. Now, it might not be circumcision that people will use, but people are constantly trying to add works to salvation. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on that this evening because it, there's nothing new under the sun. People have always been trying to do this. People will always try to do this. And if you could try to group, if you look at all of Christianity in general today, you just look at the whole scope of Christianity, it's separated into two types of Christianity. Those that believe in faith only, no other works, nothing else saves you, and then everybody else is adding some kind of works to that. I don't care who you are. People will say, you know, oh, well, you have to be baptized. To be, because faith is not enough, you also have to be baptized. Or they'll say, you know, Faith isn't enough. You also have to um, you know, give up all of your sins and repent of your sins in order to be saved. It's not just faith in Christ. People add all kinds of different things that are works. And we're going to look at a few of those things. The first one I want to turn to is, um, if you would, keep a finger in, in Acts chapter 15. Because the most common thing today, turn if you would to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 in the Old Testament. It's after the major prophets. It's in the minor prophets. Jonah chapter number 3. Because the most common form of work salvation that you're going to find in, the, in today's society that's being preached today very widely is this heresy that says that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Now look, I know that the Bible uses the word repent. And I know that sometimes it uses the word repent to talk about salvation. But it never says that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Now let me ask you this. Repenting of your sins, would that be similar to say maybe, you know, turning from your wickedness? Turning from, a, from your wicked way? Would be a pretty fair definition of repenting of your sins, right? Well, look, John, look down at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. You see, people will tell you today, if you don't turn from your sins, if you don't turn from your wicked way, then you cannot be saved or you were never saved. But the Bible defines turning from your evil way as works in Jonah 3, chapter 10. You can't get around it. God saw their works. What did they do? What works did you see, God? What works was it that they turned from their evil way? If I have to turn from my evil way in order to be saved, hey, that's a works-based salvation. The Bible says that, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if the Bible says in one place it's not of works, but then someone else is saying, Well, no, you have to turn from your sins. You have to repent of your sins and be saved. And the Bible calls that works. you got a contradiction. They can't both be true. No, my friends. The Bible is, is, is clear, it's true, salvation is a free gift, it's given to us for free, we don't earn it, we, can't, we don't deserve it, it has nothing to do with how good of a person you are, or how much you try not to sin, or whether before you're saved, after you're saved, it has nothing to do with it. It's a gift that's given to you for free, you just have to receive it. Put your faith on Jesus Christ, that's how you receive the gift. But I know I've, I've spent plenty of sermons just just 
destroying that repent of your sins heresy. I don't want to spend too much time on that specific one because a lot of other people will say, you go back and turn to Acts if you would. Um, we're done in Jonah. A lot of people will also say that you have to be baptized to be saved. Now this comes out of the Pentecostal movement, the Charismatic movement. Um, a lot of those people, in the Catholics even, will say that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's why they baptize infants. Because they're afraid that if their infant dies before he's baptized, that they're going to go to purgatory or hell or something else. My friends, again, this is not true. And a couple of verses that people will use. Again, I'm not afraid to turn to the verses in the Bible that people will try to twist. Because I believe them wholeheartedly. The verses are true, but what people do is they take them and they twist them and they pervert them and they try to get you to believe that they mean something that they don't. In Acts 2.38, the Bible says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, nowhere does that say you have to be baptized in order to be saved, first of all. Now, the way they try, to, they try to twist this, they'll say, well, they say, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So they're saying, see, it's saying, in order for you, for your sins to be, to, to receive remission of your sins, they say you have to be baptized. That's not true. That word for, they're, just not, they're completely misunderstanding what that word for means. You get baptized because of the remission of your sins. Because you've already been saved. That's why in Acts 8.37 says the requirement for even getting baptized to begin with is that you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is when you get saved and you get baptized because you've been saved. Because your sins have been washed away. Then you get baptized showing your open faith. Showing what you've done. And, and um, that's why you get baptized. It's not, it's not the twisting of the scripture where they try to tell you, no, you need to be baptized in order for your sins to be washed away. That's simply false. Oh and in Mark 16, 16, the Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This is the other place that people will try to turn to and say, well, see, look, the Bible says that if you believe and you're baptized, you shall be saved. Well, you know what? I believe this verse 100%. Guess what? I believe and I've been baptized and I'm saved. Okay? I believe I'm wearing a suit tonight. And I'm saved. Does that mean that I have to wear a suit in order to be saved? Nope. I was saved the moment I believed. Believe takes care of the salvation. So you can add anything to the end of that verse that says, Whosoever he that believeth and whatever you want to add is saved. That statement is completely true. It, it's no. I mean, if you understand, let's see. I'm a very logical person. I'm a computer programmer. This is something that this is the way my mind thinks. It's it's a it's a very simple logical premise. When you think, as soon as you as you fulfill the fact that you believe, anything else you add to that, you're still saved. And it, it doesn't mean that it had you had to you know stand on a chair and you believe you're saved. If I stand on this chair, that doesn't make me saved. But because I believe, that makes me saved. And then furthermore. As further proof within the same verse, it goes on to say who's damned. It doesn't say, but he that isn't baptized is damned. It says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The first part says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Well, what about the people that believe and aren't baptized? Well, it says, he that believeth not shall be damned. They believe they're not damned. I mean, the verse itself just, just handles everything perfectly. There's nothing wrong with this verse. There's no mistake. There's no error in this verse. But it's also not teaching that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's not true. That's adding a work to salvation. Now, these things are more commonly taught today. People don't really get hung up about this. You know, in, in their day, it was circumcision, right? It was the males being circumcised. They said, no, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. People don't do that today, and one of the reasons why is because it's destroyed in the Bible. There are so many epistles, there's so many places in the Bible that clearly explain that circumcision is nothing. And I've got a bunch of these verses already here. We're going to see that um, it has nothing to do with works. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter 4 handles 
again, the fact that we're saved by grace and that it's not of the works of the law. And it also covers the circumcision as well. And see, back then people were, were, were thinking, because when God made his covenant with Abraham, just so you understand, when God made the covenant with Abraham, he made a promise with Abraham, he told him, he, he sealed that covenant with circumcision. That's the first time circumcision was ever even introduced. So, first of all, it's kind of silly to say, well, everyone up to Abraham, they got saved some different way, but then as soon as God said you have to be circumcised, then that's how you had to be saved afterwards. That doesn't make any sense. The Bible is very clear. Everybody has always been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ or in the Lord, right, before they knew the name of Jesus Christ. It's still putting your faith completely in Jesus. We're going to see that here in Romans chapter 4. God gave Abraham the, the, the covenant that was sealed with circumcision. But that's not what saved Abraham, and that's not what ever saved anybody after that. But that's the, that was a sign of the keeping of the law. Romans 4, look at verse number 1. We're going to start reading. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of to glory, but not before God. So it's saying here, look, if Abraham were justified by his works because he was such a great guy and all the good things that he did, it says that he'd be able to glory in that. He'd be able to boast in that. He'd be able to brag about it, say, hey, I'm such a great person. That's why I'm, that's why I'm justified. It says, but not before God, he wouldn't. You might, be able, you might be able to get away with that before man. You might be able to have man see you and you can glory and boast, say, oh, I'm such a great person. Look how good I am. I do all these good works and I help people out. That might work in front of man, but it's not going to work before God. Verse number three, for what said the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham's faith is what made him righteous before God. In God's eyes, he sees Abraham had faith in him. That's what made him justified. That's what made him righteous. That's what got his soul saved it was his faith in God. Verse 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So what he's saying here is that, look, if you go out and you do work, what you receive for your work, that's not grace. Grace is something that's bestowed upon you. Grace is something that you receive that you don't deserve. It's something that you get. It's like a gift. You don't deserve it. You don't work for it. It's something that's just given to you for free. That's what grace is. He says to him that worketh. So if I go out and go, like if I go to my job, when I work, I work for two weeks. I put in 80 hours. I get a paycheck at the end of that two weeks. The boss doesn't say, well, here's a gift. I just, I just felt like you should have this. You know, here's a gift. I want you to have that. That's not how it works. I put in my time. I worked and I earned that money. That money is something that I was owed. It's a debt that was owed to me by putting in my time, my effort, my energy, my work for my boss. Hey, that's a debt. That's why the Bible says in verse 5 or in verse 4, now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. It's not my boss's grace that he gives me a paycheck. It's because I worked for him. It's debt. He owes it to me. Verse 5, but look at this. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So here you have someone, they do no works. Him that worketh not. No good works, but they believe. They believe on him that justified the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. It's not our works that save us. Putting our faith in Christ is what saves us. And that's why it's God's grace. That's the only way it could be grace is because he's giving us something that we don't deserve. It's a gift. It's not something we earn and deserve and we work for. In verse 6, he goes on further to explain this. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Again, tell that to the, to the Mormons, right? That say that, oh, well, faith without works is dead and that you can't be saved unless you have works. Well, the Bible says that blessed is the man in whom God imputeth righteousness without works. God imputes righteousness. That means he gives you righteousness without works. Just because of the fact that you have faith. Which again shows that, it, yes, it is possible to have faith without works. 
Because right here he's saying he's going to impute righteousness to someone that doesn't have works, but they have faith. Now to him that worketh not, we saw in verse 5, but believe it. You can have faith without works. Now, yes, your faith may die without works, but it doesn't mean that you haven't received eternal life. You haven't gotten that gift of salvation. In verse 7 it says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to, the whole, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now I just want to point out real quick, this might seem real basic and real simple for everyone that's here tonight. We know that we're saved. We know that we're saved by grace. We know this stuff. But I want you to listen because this, if nothing else, Try to pick up on some of the things that I'm expounding here, some of these verses, because they're going to be very effective about soul winning. Because a lot of people believe in workspace salvation. And try to let these, these verses sink in you. Make note of them. Remember them. Remember to be able to turn to Romans chapter 4, because we're going to go to a bunch of places tonight that just clearly define salvation by grace and not of works. So many people, they are hung up on their works. I talk to people and they'll say, you know, I'll ask them, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? Do you know for sure you go to heaven? Like, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Well, because I'm a pretty good person. Because I help people out. <laughs> because I'm good to animals. You know, I hear all kinds of different things. It's basically just people are saying, I'm not that bad. Yeah, I've done some wrong. You know, we've all done some wrong, but I'm not that bad. I never killed anybody. They're relying on their works. My friend, the works are not going to save you. And the Bible is very clear about that. And the religious folk then will say, well, you must be circumcised and believe in order to be saved. No, that's not true. In fact, the Bible considers even circumcision a work of the law. And we've already established that salvation is not by works. We're going to continue reading in Romans chapter 4. Look at verse number 9. He says, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. This blessedness that he just described. The blessedness of having your righteousness imputed unto you without works. Right? That's the blessedness he's talking about. Is it for the circumcision or for the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So what this is explaining here, it might be a little bit tricky to read the words. Basically what I was saying is that, look, when did Abraham receive righteousness? When Abraham believed God, he was not circumcised already. God found him faithful first before he gave him that seal of circumcision. He already had that righteousness prior to ever being circumcised. Basically what he's saying here, verse number 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. It's a sign, it was a seal of the faith that he already had, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. It's the same exact thing that we do with baptism today. Baptism is a sign. It's a, it's a sign of the seal of the righteousness of the faith that we have. It's something you do after you believe. And just like circumcision was something that they did. Now they did it on the eighth day with their children when they were born. It was slightly different in that sense. Right? But when Abraham received it, he received it as a seal of the promise that he had because of his faith. And then it says in verse 13, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. He's saying, those that follow the law, those that obey the law, if they're heirs, heirs is something that you inherit, right? So like if, um, you know, let's just say, for example, like my parents were to die, God forbid, and, and they have an inheritance, they have their, their house and land and property, whatever, the heirs would be me and my brothers because we're their descendants. So, so their, their goods and their possessions pass on to us. And that comes by nature of just us being their children, right? That's why we're the heirs. But he's saying here that if, 
if you are become an heir because you're following and obeying the law, he says faith is made void. You don't need faith. Faith has nothing to do with it then if you're, if you're made an heir by obeying the law. He says, and the promise is made of none effect. Verse 15, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The law is the reason why we're sinners. Because without the law, there would be no sin. The reason why we're sinners is because we've broken the law. We cannot attain, we cannot become an heir of salvation by obeying the law. We've all transgressed the law. We've already screwed that up. We've already broken it. We have to receive the promise. Abraham received a promise. God made Abraham a promise, and he said, In these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And um, he made him a promise that, that of his seed, you know, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And, that, and basically gave him the promise that Jesus Christ was going to be an heir of his one day and was going to bring salvation. That was a promise that was made. See, if you earn something, if you work for it, if you put in your time, you don't need a promise. The promise is given to you because you don't deserve it. You're not going to earn it on your own. You can't do it. But the promise was made saying that you're going to have it. And you just have to receive it. Now, in your Romans 4, turn back just to Romans chapter 2 real quick. We're going to look at one verse there that just, that just destroys you know, this argument about circumcision specifically. Romans 2, verse 25, the Bible says, For circumcision verily profited, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. And look, the only way circumcision is going to do you any good is if you keep the law. And guess what? Like I said before, we've already broken that. It's not going to do you any good. He says, if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is just, it's made uncircumcision. Because that was the covenant of keeping the law, which was already been broken. The, cir the circumcision. First, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18, the Bible says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. That's it. It's just, it's, it's the law. So doing something, performing circumcision, keeping that is, is basically obeying the law. And salvation has not come through the law. Yet these people tried to, to continue to say, that, that you know you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. If you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. And one of the reasons they kept they were saying that is because the apostles were going out to the Gentiles. They were going out to the Greeks. They were going out to all these different nations and bringing the gospel unto them and getting them saved. And you see, the Jews by and large were all pretty much circumcised already anyways. Because they were following the law in that respect. So what they were doing is they were coming in and saying, Oh wait, all these people want to be believers in God? No, you have to be circumcised. And they were trying to bring them back into bondage of the law. Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And see, that defines what the real problem is. That is what the work salvation crowd never seems to comprehend. Their confidence is not completely in Christ. Their confidence is in their flesh. The same way that, that these false brethren was that came in and were trying to deceive the people, saying, no, you have to be circumcised, their confidence was in their flesh. It's the same exact thing with people say, nope, you got to be baptized. Nope, you have to do good works. Nope, you have to do whatever it is. You add whatever works to it, their confidence is in their flesh. And I'll prove it to you. Romans chapter 11, if you would, please turn to Romans chapter 11. You cannot mix faith with works. You can't do it. As soon as you do that, you end up with works. You have faith on this hand, you have works on this hand, right? What's going to get you saved? And people say, well, I believe in Jesus, 
but you also have to be baptized. Exactly what they're doing here. Well, I believe in Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised, right? Circumcisions, the baptism, those are works. Those obedience to the law. Faith is not of the law, it's just your belief. It's your faith in Christ. And as soon as you mix the two and say, well, you need both. Well, you know what? As soon as you do that, that faith, it's no longer faith. Now it's works. You see, you add a little bit of works, it's all works. Romans 11, uh, verse 6 explains that perfectly. It says, and if by grace, then is it no more of works. You say, look, if you're saved by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it is of works, but if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And it goes back to the same example I was given about my paycheck. Look, it's either I did my work or I'm just receiving a gift. You can't, you can't mix the two together. Like as soon as you start doing some work, and again, it might be a good deal. You might be getting a little bit more than you even worked for, but if you worked for it, you worked for it, right? Um, you know, I, I like to say, if, um, you know, let's say I wanted to give away something that's really expensive, you know, a $100,000 car, well, I give away a Ferrari to somebody, right? But then I say, well, I want you to have this. It's my gift to you. But you got to give me $1, right? So that's the only way I'm going to give it to you is you could give me a dollar. Really expensive gift. I mean, hey, you'd be foolish to pass up that deal, right? But let me ask you this. If you paid a dollar, is that still a gift? It's not a gift. Now you just purchased it. You might have gotten the deal of the century. <laughs> you might have got a, 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 the best deal on this planet. But you still bought it. It no longer, by definition, it's no longer a gift. Well, you want to add that little bit of works into your faith to trust in to get you saved. You say, well, you just, I'm just adding in baptism. You don't have to do it one time. You don't have to keep on doing it, right? One little thing. You, know, you have to believe and be baptized. You have to be baptized to be saved. All of a sudden now, you're just believing in work salvation. You, you, you don't believe okay. it's by faith. You believe it's, it's by works. When you start adding any type of work to it, it's work salvation. And that's, that's what Romans 11.6 is explaining here, that it, it, they're mutually exclusive. You cannot have works and you can't have faith mixed together because it, they don't mix. <clears throat> now, there's always going to be people that try to add works to salvation. They're always out there. And ultimately, I believe it's due to their own pride. And the reason why I say that is because you have to be able to humble yourself in order to receive that free gift. When you have to realize that I can't do it on my own. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve the gift. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve hell. That's what I deserve for my sins. When you realize that, when you humble yourself, then you can just accept that free gift. With thankfulness in your heart to God. Just thank you God for saving me. I don't deserve it. I'm receiving that free gift. But see, when people want to add in works, it's, it's that little bit of pride that's in them. That's saying, no, I did something. I did something to be a part of this. I did something to get my way into heaven. I gave up my sins. I started living a righteous life. I started doing all these things. God says, no, you wicked sinner. No. It's a free gift, and you have to receive it as such. Mark 10, 15 says, Verily, verily, I say, verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. A little child. A little child is capable of having that type of faith. My little children have faith that I'm going to provide meals for them. That we're going to clothe them. We're going to provide them shelter. That's the type of faith that they have. They completely trust in us. They don't worry. They don't, they don't stay up at night wondering if they're going to be able to eat the next day. We provide it for them. They completely trust in us. Hey, we have to have that childlike faith in God and just completely trust Him to save us. It's that simple. James 4, 6 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, wherefore, he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You have to humble yourselves. You have to have that humble attitude in order to receive the grace. 
Otherwise, God's going to resist you. You have pride, God's going to resist you. You humble yourself, God's going to give you grace. Now, some people are a little bit more subtle with their works, and they'll try to tell you that, okay, well, wait, you'll say, well, yeah, no, faith saves you. Say, but if you don't have the works, then you never were saved. And this is a, a repackaging and, and, and trying to put the works over here instead of over here. Look, it's still, they're still believing in a works-based salvation. I'm sorry. If a person believes in their heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved. I don't care if they go out and drink or fornicate or do anything else after they're saved. If they did that with their heart, then they're saved. If they believe, they're saved. And that's the bottom line. And you say, well, a person saved ever do that? Yes. I'll tell you what, you're looking at one. I got saved when I was 20 years old. Do you think I was a perfect Christian the day after I got saved? No way. People would look at me and they wouldn't even know I was a Christian. I didn't like to talk about it. I knew I was a hypocrite. If I was going to start telling people, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm going out and doing all this stuff. But it doesn't make me, it didn't make me unsaved. And I know a lot of people that are like that. You see, we still have the flesh. Until we receive a glorified God body, until we're changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, we still have this flesh. This flesh likes to sin. This flesh is going to war after our spirit. And if you let the flesh win, that doesn't mean that you don't have the spirit of God inside of you. It just means that you're weak and that you're letting your flesh Decide what you're going to do with your life and not walk in the Spirit. And then you're going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But that doesn't make you unsaved. And people will try to tell you, don't let these people get your head spun around trying to tell you that you're not saved. Like the Paul Washers of this world that will tell you, well, you're not saved if you're going to commit sin. Well, what about David? What about Moses? What about all these other great men of God that have gone out and they've committed adultery and they've murdered and they've done all kinds of bad things after they believed? After they got saved. Don't come here with that nonsense. You do not have to have that the works in order to prove that you were saved. Now, in man's eyes, that's how man looks and you're going to be justified. And that's what James is talking about. If you read the book of James, he's talking about being justified in man's eyes. And I'm not saying it's not important to be justified in man's eyes by living a Christian life and by living and walking in the Spirit and doing what's right. It's important, but it has, nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with you being saved. That doesn't mean you're unsaved if you're not walking in the Spirit. That's why we're commanded to, to, to put away the flesh, die to self daily, walk in the Spirit. That's why you're admonished so many times throughout the Bible, because obviously it's possible not to walk in the Spirit. And this is why all this stuff, this is why in Acts 15, too, go back to Acts 15 if you would. We're going to go back to the chapter. I told you, this is, um, uh, there's no way I'm going to get to all the, the chapter tonight. But it's basically all the same story. It covers this one subject. And there's one more thing we're going to want to, I want to point out about this. In Acts 15, too, it says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the prophets, prophets and elders about this question. Paul and Barnabas, they had no small dissension. It means it wasn't just some minor disagreement. They didn't say, well, you know, yeah, you, you believe that way, I believe this way, but whatever, you know, we're, we're all Christians. No, they had no small dissension and disputation with them about it. It wasn't a minor thing. When they said, well, no, you have to be circumcised, we said, no, absolutely not. They did not believe that for a second, and they stood up and said, no. That's not what it is. We know it's by grace through faith. You can't fool us. You don't have to be circumcised. And I'll tell you what, this is why I'm spending so much time preaching against this too. Because I'm not going to make a small disputation about this. I want this to be crystal clear in everybody's heads that we do not believe in works-based salvation. And Galatians 1, turn if you would to Galatians. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Galatians 2 and in Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 2 is going to provide a little bit more insight into this story. We already read the whole chapter. That's why I'm not too worried about going through each verse line by line. But um, Galatians chapter 1 also explains why we do not have a small disputation about salvation, about the gospel of grace. Galatians chapter 1. After 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, look at verse number 6. He says, I marvel 
that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, I preach the gospel unto you, but now I'm marveling, I'm, I'm surprised that you're so soon removed from the gospel I gave unto you unto another gospel. He says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. You see these people that like to add works unto salvation? It's not a completely different gospel. They're not saying that like you have to believe in something completely different. But what they're doing is they're perverting the gospel of Christ. They're twisting it. They're taking the gospel and they're just they're perverting it, twisting it, making it into a lie. It says in uh, verse 8, but it says, But the we or an angel from heaven, again, Mormon, but the we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says, I don't care if an angel comes down from heaven and tells you something different. Let him be accursed. If it's not the gospel that we preach unto you, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's where the Mormons believe that, you know, we're both, or, um, I don't even know their stupid names. They, you know, they believe that Joseph Smith was, you know, was communicating with an angel from God. And that's where he got these revelations. And this angel told him all these different things and revealed all this stuff unto him. And you know what? That was a lying devil. That told him those things. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. Paul's saying here in verse 8, let him be accursed. Verse number 9, as we said before, so say I now again. He's going to repeat himself. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. This is no small matter. This is no matter for small disputation or dissension. This is a big deal. This is salvation. This cuts to the core of everything. This is the reason why some people are going to hell instead of to heaven. It's a big deal. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. So Paul and Barnabas, they weren't the ones that were asking to go to Jerusalem to get this matter settled. They knew that. Other people in the church that were up there, they're saying, well, let's send you to Peter. Let's send you to John. Let's see what they have to say about this because... They knew that, you know, Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem. They were the followers. They were disciples of Christ. So they're saying, well, let's just, you know, let's just see what they have to say about it. Go to, go to like a higher authority or a higher source. Now, the people that came in that were saying you had to be circumcised, they were false brethren, crept in unawares. And I can prove that here in Galatians chapter 2. Okay, Galatians chapter 2 is referring to the same events that were going on in Acts chapter 15. Paul is recounting what happened in Acts chapter 15 with all this stuff going on here in Galatians 2. And if you're interested, you could, you could prove it for yourself. Galatians 1 and Galatians 2 explain like the different cities and the places they visited. And it lines up exactly with, with the places they visited before and after Acts 15. So you can see that this is talking about the same event, and it just lines up anyways. I mean, just reading it. We're going to start reading in verse number 1, Galatians 2. The Bible says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So in, in chapter 1, he's explaining how basically right after he got saved, he went out and was preaching the gospel. He saw Peter once, but then he was gone. Like, he didn't really spend any time in Jerusalem. He was going out and spreading the gospel. So then fourteen years after... And this covers about the time that we see in, in, in Acts of Paul's, um, you know, what he was doing. We saw in Acts 13 and 14, they were called of God to do this great work. They were traveling around. They were starting churches. Hey, 14 years is about the right amount of time for them to be able to do the work that they did um, with starting those churches in these areas. 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that, because of false brethren unaware, is brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he's saying, look, these people came in, they were false brethren, and they were bringing in circumcision, because that's what he's saying, that even Titus 
you know, he says, was um, compelled to be circumcised. Because of the false brethren, they were saying, no, look, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And they were bringing in this damnable heresy. They were false brethren, but, but you know, Titus wasn't, wasn't sound with that, and, and he ended up, you know, he was compelled to be circumcised because he was a Greek. But Paul says that, whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. We didn't give them any place. We didn't give them any, any room to speak their, their false doctrine. He said that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, now he's going to be talking about when he went down to Jerusalem. But to these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So he's saying, first of all, he's kind of making a point here that, look, they that seem to be pillars, he said, God doesn't respect the person of any man. He's basically kind of saying here, look, we didn't need to go down to Jerusalem to get this established. You don't need to go to some man, to some figurehead, you know, to get all of your answers about the faith. We don't need that. God's given us the Holy Spirit and we have his scripture. Okay? God can teach us. That's why we're independent Baptists. We don't rely on anyone else. I don't need to go running to Pastor Anderson at Faithful Word. I don't go, have to go running to any other church and, and go and, and bring a message and say, oh, what should we do? What should we do? No, we've got the Bible. We've got the Holy Ghost. We can understand and we can decide for ourselves this is true and this is not true. Now look, I like talking to other people and bouncing doctors off them and having discussions and stuff like that. That's great. But especially for something like this, I mean, you're talking about salvation. You don't need to get like this one authority figure to tell you that this is the way that it is. And that's what he's saying here is that, look, God's not a respecter of persons. God's law is what it is. It says what it says. These people who seem to be pillars and, and these, these authorities, he said they added nothing to me in conference with them. He already knew all this stuff. They didn't add anything to what he had to say. That it was no different than what he was already preaching and teaching. He didn't need their approval. He didn't need letters of commendation from them. He was preaching the truth. He was preaching the Bible. But, um, you know, and he's not, like, giving them a hard time. It's just the fact that, like, the church even sent them down. You know, they didn't have to do that. But um, it says here that they were false prophets. And then um, the rest of the story also gives us a little bit... Well, I'll keep reading here. I kind of stop in the middle. It says... Uh, in verse 7, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that grace was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto heathen, and they to circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now, there's a little bit more happens here in Galatians 2. We're starting looking at verse number 11. And it gives us a little bit more insight on kind of the beliefs that the Jews had at that time and how much influence the false brethren had and, and, and how these false doctrines spread. In verse 11 it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So again, I think he's kind of shining some light into, hey, these people who were perceived to be the, the pillars and the foundation of the faith, he was said Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. Now look, Peter was a great man of God, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, a, a great man of God, used greatly, you know, one of, the, one of the top disciples of Christ. You know, not taking anything away from him, but he was still a man. He was still a human, and he was still a sinner, just like you and I are sinners, okay? He was not perfect. He is not the Pope. You know, Catholics might try to tell you he's the first Pope, but he is not the Pope. Okay, Peter was a man. He had faults. He had a lot of great things, great attributes around, but he had faults. And Paul is pointing out here, and you know what? The Bible's, God is very careful. 
that no one person in the entire Bible gets lifted up too high. Not one. God has a lot of respect for people. He gives a lot of praise to people. You think of Noah. You think of Job. He's talking about how righteous they were. Yet the Bible talks about, it always is sure to bring up at least one of their faults. So that we don't lift these people up too high, above measure, above that they are. Because, hey, they're human too. I mean, Noah, after he got off the, the ark, got drunk. Now, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He did all kinds of great things. I mean, God decided to save him and his family and wipe everyone else out. Noah was a righteous man, yet he still had faults. We all have faults. And we're going to see one of Peter's here. But what's interesting about this fault here, look at verse number 12. We get a little bit more insight because this is kind of something that was going on almost in the Jewish culture. Verse number 12 says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So before these men came up from Jerusalem, that they were James' friends, before they came up, these Jews, he was eating with the Gentiles. He didn't have a problem with it. There was nothing wrong with it. He was saying, okay, you know, I'm going to eat with you. Not a big deal. But then as soon as they came up, he feared those people and what they were going to think about them because they had that custom. We covered this earlier in the book of Acts that... Um, Peter already got by revelation that what God hath cleansed, that call, call not thou common or unclean. And that the Jews at that time had a law, had their own law that said, you, you know, you were forbidden to eat with the Gentiles. You couldn't, you couldn't um, eat with someone from another nation, basically. So when he was eating with them, Peter already knew this. He was taught this by God way earlier. Yet when they came up, he feared them. And he withdrew himself. And this infected other people as well. Look at verse number 13. It says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. When you sin, when you know something's wrong, and you do it anyways, especially you do it publicly, hey, you're going to be dragging a lot of other people down with you. People will see that, and it, it, it affects people. Peter was a leader. He was someone that people followed. They see him doing wrong. Guess what? They start doing wrong too. Not only did he sin for himself, he also brought all these other people with him. And where did it stem from? It stemmed from fear. The Bible says a fear not. The only fear that we should have is a fear of the Lord. That's it. Don't fear man. Don't fear what man can do unto you. Fear God and keep his commandments. The Bible says. But um, he feared them with the circumcision because it was so ingrained in their culture that they just they, they couldn't eat with the Gentiles. So when they came up, he was, he was kind of scared of that because he was. But he did wrong. And then it says in verse uh, 14, it says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, I look, Galatians 2.16 is a great verse when you're trying to witness to people, or you're soul winning to people, because it tells you that by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. None. You are not going to be justified by your works. Your deeds cannot do it. And he brings this up to Peter saying, look, you're a Jew. Why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We couldn't bear it. You know, God gave them circumcision. He gave them the law and they failed. They couldn't, they, they couldn't keep the law. They couldn't keep the circumcision. They couldn't keep that covenant, that old covenant. They couldn't do it. That's why it had to be done away. So why are you trying to convince these other people to keep the law and to follow the old covenant? You're saved by grace. And that's where it says, uh, we'll turn back to Acts 15. We're done in Galatians now. We're gonna just, I'm going to try to finish out here. In Acts 15, look at verse number 5. It says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, I believe here, see, the, the false brethren that came in said that you must be circumcised in order to be saved. 
This says here there was a sect of the Pharisees which believed. So it says they were believers. But they were saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to keep the law of Moses. I don't believe that they believed that you had to do those things in order to be saved. I think they were saying that, well, no, you should also get circumcised and keep the law. Right? I mean, similarly, where we would say, you know, just because you're saved by grace doesn't mean you just go out and just commit every single sin under the sun. Of course not. You don't do that. You know, you still, we still adhere to God's laws and, and follow them and, and do, you know, and live the way we're supposed to. So I think what they're saying, what, what the discussion became of this, it wasn't about salvation and it was this, the fact that, look, some of the, some of the Pharisees that believed were saying, well, no, we still need to circumcise them. We still, we still need to keep the law that way. But that's because they didn't understand that, that no, circumcision was a sign and it was for the time then present. And that's done away with, with Jesus Christ. And um, Peter, set, Peter ends up settling the matter in verse number 7. He says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Again, there's the gospel. Then they just believe it. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He clears up and just says unequivocally, it's by grace through faith. They believe, and God even bear them witness. See, here's the thing. God doesn't always bear people witness today. God let the, when, when Peter gave the gospel to the Gentiles, back in, I forget what chapter of Acts that was, like 8 or um, 7, I don't remember exactly the chapter. When he went and preached the gospel, and they believed, they were able to speak with other tongues. God gave them, see when Peter was preaching to them, they, started, they received the Holy Ghost and they started speaking with other tongues. They were speaking other languages. And that was done to bear witness that they got saved and that they believed so that Peter could just fully understand and just, and just have it without a doubt. Oh, hey, God laid the Holy Ghost upon them also that they can do the same things that we're doing. There must not be a difference between us since God poured out those blessings on them the same way that he did on us. And God bear them witness because he knew their hearts, right? Now, God doesn't pour out his Holy Spirit and give that type of a witness necessary to every single person that believes today. You don't see every single believer doing these miracles and able to, to speak in other languages that they don't know and, and having that, that, that gift that God has bestowed upon them. God did that with specific people for a specific reason during this time. He, God knows the heart. Man doesn't always know the heart. And that's why it's important to understand, again, going back to that, well, if you don't have the works, then you couldn't have been saved. God knows your heart. Now, he, with these people, he bear them witness by giving them the Holy Ghost the same way he did unto the disciples. So Peter settles the matter. Look at verse number 10. It says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And again, the Jews got saved the same way that the Gentiles got saved, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. He said, we got saved the same way as they, by believing, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. It's by grace, it's not of works. Now, in this story, man, I'm like, I'm like totally out of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up here, because this is important. Oh, i got two more pages left. James expresses his affirmation of what Peter just said. So in his story, in Acts 15, we're not going to read all the verses. James basically says, okay, you know, like, yes, God has called the Gentiles, the people, you know, and they're saved the same way. And then in verse 19, he says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Verse 21, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, I think it's interesting. Like, they have this whole discussion, and Peter just says, look, we're saved by grace through faith. And that's it. Like, they're saved the same way we are. And that was the whole point that they even were having this discussion, this meeting even came up. 
was because that there were some people, the false brother, were saying, no, you have to be circumcised to be saved. <clears throat> but then James adds this in and saying, well, we should still write unto them to abstain from pollution of idols or from fornication, from things strangled, which I don't see anywhere in the Bible where things strangled is a sin anyways. I mean, it talks about, you know, idolatry and not eating the blood and those types of things, but he adds in there strangled. I think that was something that they just observed that was more of a doctrine of man, not of God. But he throws all this stuff in there. But see, the question was about salvation, and that was settled, that it's not a circumcision of the law. But he adds this admonition to keep those specific things. So they end up writing this letter to Antioch, right? And they send people with them. So they're saying, look, we're going you know, to write this letter, and then with Paul and Barnabas, we're going to send them back, and we're also going to send a couple other disciples with you, just confirming everything that they said <coughs> and everything that we said here, and just kind of settle the matter completely. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, verse 23, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well. Fare ye well. Now, we see that it's important because it said, he said that the people that were telling them these lies were subverting their souls. The people trying to add works of salvation are out there trying to subvert souls. I mean, they're undermining salvation. They're trying to undermine these people's faith. They're saying they didn't, you know, they came from us, but they were not of us. And, um, it, you know, he's saying that it's, it's by grace. And look, our beloved Paul and Barnabas, right, they were right. So everything that they were already saying before, they were right in that matter. We're also going to send Judas and Silas with them just to, just to confirm it and say it. And then, so then they add this up that James brought up. But notice what they say, though. They don't say that you need to keep these things in order to be saved. He says, if you keep yourselves from those things, you shall do well. And that's exactly it. Look, if you keep yourself from sins, if you keep yourself in the grace of God by just by you know, obeying the commandments and doing what's right, you're going to do well. That's good advice. But, um, you know, they're obviously definitely not necessary for your salvation. That's how we're going to do well. And I'm going to close with this. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, Paul wrote, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, maketh no matter me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Again, people often have this tendency to put too much confidence in man and in the opinions of man. The people at Antioch should have been able to, to look at the scripture and determine if Paul was right or not, instead of having to send him to Jerusalem to get these answers. We don't need to, to go to the... And again, look, there's nothing wrong with, with asking your pastor questions about the Bible or, or talking to other Christians about the Bible and saying, hey, you know, I saw this, what do you think this means? And just kind of bounce ideas off of them. Whatever, there's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to just say, like, well, whatever they say... That's what we're going to believe. Like, like, I'm not going to believe anything what's shown to me or proven to me out of Scripture unless I hear it out of this person's mouth. That's not the way that, 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 you should, that anybody should, um, should have their faith. So well, I'm going to finish off the chapter real quick. We couldn't get to all of it. But basically then what happens is they send them that letter, they go back, and then they're pleased. I mean, everyone's happy for the consolation, it says. They're consoled, they're happy, they're glad that, look, it's a relief. You know, we don't have to keep the law in order to be saved. It's just by faith. And then, um, so then Paul gets this idea. He's like, hey, look, Bar you know, he talks to Barnabas and says, let's go around and let's confirm all the people. Let's go back and visit all these churches that we started up and we did before. Let's go see how they're doing. And Barnabas is like, great, yeah, let's go do that. But he wanted to bring, so they have this, this disputation here about bringing um, um, John, John Mark, because he went with them prior, but then he left. He cut out. 
He didn't finish the work with them. He started going and went. So Paul's like, look, let's not take this guy. He left once before. I don't want him with us now. You know, he's basically lost his opportunity as far as Paul's concerned. But Barb was like, no, look, he's good now. Let's take him. So they had this argument and it said that the, the, the dissension was so sharp between them that they just left from each other. Now, they still went and did all this good work, but they're just like, okay, we're just going to go our separate ways here. And, um, you know, sometimes that happens among brethren. Now, you shouldn't hold a grudge against people. You, know, you should be forgiving. But, I mean, don't let that stop you from God's work either. I mean, they both just went different ways. They went different paths and fine. You know, whatever. They continued on doing good work for God. But that's about all that else that happened in 15. So we'll be jumping into chapter 16 next week. And let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for, for our salvation that's given to us as a free gift by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to be vigilant and be wary of the people who will continuously try to bring in works and try to add it in to, to the faith of our salvation, dear God, and try to subvert our souls. Lord, help us to, to be aware of this and to not let this false doctrine creep in, dear Lord. Um, help, help us to be learned in the scriptures that someone wouldn't be able to come to us with um, with one verse and, and try to twist it out of context and try to show us that, see, you have to be baptized and believe in order to be saved or, or one of these other examples here, Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to know the Bible, study the Bible, and that we would be able to um, lead others to the truth. Help us to be better soul winners, dear God. Help us to memorize your word and to keep it in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.